Hello and welcome to this lecture on fuel use. This is fuel use during physical activity. In this slide, you're seeing an image from your text. It's showing you a number of things, but mostly the delivery of oxygen by your heart and your lungs to your muscles. So in this, in this image, you're looking primarily at the cardiorespiratory system. Your cardiorespiratory system in responds to increased demand for oxygen by building up its capacity to deliver oxygen. Researchers can measure your cardiovascular fitness by measuring the amount of oxygen that you consume per minute while working out. This measure of fitness which indicates your maximum rate of oxygen consumption is called your VO2 max. In step one, your respiratory system delivers oxygen to the blood. The circulatory system carries oxygenated blood throughout the body, and then the muscles and other tissues obtain oxygen from the blood and release carbon dioxide into it. The blood carries the carbon dioxide back to the lungs. You see the exchange of other gases. Your energy needs and your physical activity levels and goals drive your individual energy needs. So people of differing physical fitness levels will have very different energy needs, and energy, of course, refers to calories. Working out lightly may require little to no extra energy above your baseline needs. But as your activity and fitness levels increase and progress more along the scale toward the intensity level, your energy needs will greatly increase. There's a concept known as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption. This is a measure of increased metabolism or energy expenditure that continues for minutes or hours after cessation of exercise. So not only do your needs increase when you're actually physically active, but then in the recovery phase, we know that regular physical activity helps elevate or increase your needs. One unique thing about physical fitness that you'll see kind of intertwined throughout the chapter as you read and the lectures as you listen to them is that the benefits of physical activity extend beyond the period of when you're just exercising. You actually can increase your metabolism during periods of rest if you exercise on a regular basis. So if you've exercised, let's say yesterday or earlier today, as you sit here listening to these lectures, you are actually burning more calories at rest than would be an identical person to you who did not exercise yesterday or today or on a regular basis. Again, you can increase your basal metabolism even during periods of rest if you exercise on a regular basis. And that way you've got exercise working for you both when you're actually exercising, but then also on your off periods. Glucose is your body's preferred source of energy for all levels of activity. Glycogen is stored in your body, in your liver, and your muscles. If you recall from our studies about carbohydrate, glycogen is the storage form of glucose in humans. Okay. But besides glycogen, you can get energy from other sources. Okay. You can get glycogen, for example, or, or you can get glucose, rather, from circulating bloodstream. Okay. If you had eaten a snack before, let's say, you, took, you listened to this lecture, your body could be drawing glucose from your bloodstream. But also your body can tap into your fat stores to get energy. Your glycogen supplies are not inexhaustible. Okay? They eventually could run out because you're limited to only about 2,000 calories of glucose worth of glycogen in your liver and your muscles. On the other hand, an athlete's fat stores can store over 70,000 calories or more of fuel from fat and can fuel many hours of activity. Now, however, fat alone cannot sustain physical work without the presence of glucose. And so at some point during a long period of physical activity, your body's glycogen stores are going to begin to run out. Your liver simply cannot make glucose fast enough to meet your demand. We know that the optimal macronutrient mix for an individual who's engaged in regular physical activity is a high carbohydrate diet. Okay. As you see here, um, the higher the carbohydrate content, okay, the more supportive of an athlete's endurance will that person experience. This slide refers to a classic study where a high-fat diet, okay, high-fat diet would be 94% of calories from fat and 6 from protein, a normal mixed diet, 55% of calories from carb, and the high-carb diet, 83% calories from carb, were all compared. 
and the person who had the high carbohydrate diet had the longest maximum endurance time. Driving home the notion that it's the carbohydrate content of your diet that matters most for maximizing your physical endurance. There is a difference between aerobic and anaerobic exercise. Okay? Aerobic exercise requires oxygen. Aerobic activity strengthens your heart and your lungs by requiring them to work harder than normal to deliver oxygen to your tissues. Okay? In aerobic exercise, you get your energy from glucose and fatty acids. In the anaerobic or, the, or environment that does not require oxygen, you're working a little bit differently. Okay, this is in short bursts of energy that give you quick energy, where your body is tapping into your muscle glycogen reserves. So anaerobic activity is of high intensity and short duration. Okay. This is an image from your book that's showing glucose and fatty acids in their energy-releasing pathways in muscle cells. The upper portion of this figure illustrates that glucose can yield energy quickly in anaerobic metabolism. That's without oxygen. In contrast to the high intensity muscular work, moderate physical activity, for example, things like easy jogging, can use glycogen more slowly. When you're jogging, you're gonna be breathing easily and your heart beats at a faster pace than at rest, but it's steadily beating. There's oxygen being provided, so it's aerobic. So the bottom half of this image is showing you that ample oxygen supplies during aerobic activity allow your muscles to extract or derive energy from both glucose and fatty acids by way of aerobic metabolism, and that's the one that does involve energy. By depending partly on fatty acids, moderate aerobic activity conserves those very valuable glycogen stores. Because remember, you only have about 2,000 calories worth of energy stored in your glycogen stores. Lactate is another important component of your fuel mix. Okay? Lactate is a glucose breakdown product. The anaerobic breakdown of glucose yields the compound called lactate. Now you might be familiar with lactate. As you know, it relates to the burning sensation of lactate that accumulates in a working muscle. Okay, muscles have to quickly release much of this lactate into the bloodstream to be carried to the liver where enzyme converts it back into glucose. After it's assembled, the new glucose molecules can be shipped back to the working muscles to fuel more physical work. When it comes to fatigue, there's differing levels of fitness and exercise that can induce fatigue. Low exercise intensity, we experience small amounts of lactate that are easily cleared from our tissues. It is important to note that the better trained a muscle is, the better it can actually use lactate for fuel. With very high exercise intensity, lactate production can outpace your body's ability to be able to be cleared. When lactate builds up, intense activity can only be sustained for a few minutes before fatigue sets in. So lactate doesn't necessarily cause fatigue, but high levels of lactate can be associated with fatigue. Please note that fatigue can also be caused by depletion of your muscle's glycogen content, a drop in your muscle pH, or by changes in your cell's calcium or potassium levels. Your book goes through and explains as well the relationship between the types of fuel that are used at different times or intervals of your physical activity. Within the first 10 minutes of exercise, your body is using primarily its own glycogen for fuel. Within the first 20 minutes of exercise, your body has used up roughly a fifth of your glycogen stores, and so it begins to dramatically increase its uptake of your blood glucose. And that's why having a snack prior to working out is so important, which we'll look at in the next lecture. Exercising for longer than 20 minutes puts you into a period where you use less glucose and more fat for fuel. So sometimes you hear that said that you have to exercise for greater than 20 minutes in order to tap into your fat burning capacity. And at its simplest level, that essentially is true. Although eventually your muscle and liver glycogen will eventually run out depending upon how long you work out. 
And so later in the lectures, we'll talk about when it might be appropriate to utilize a sports drink or to have a snack actually during your physical activity.